Yep. So we're going to do it this way. <laughs> Had a little te technical difficulty. But anyways, we're glad that you're rocking with us today. We thankful, we're thankful that you're here. Please hang out with us. Uh, we've got a lot of interesting and, and awesome things that are in the works. Uh, next Sunday, by the way, is Mother's Day. So we want you all to join us for another virtual experience, worship experience, where we're going to celebrate mothers and motherhood. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to do me a favor. If you have, if your mother's still with you, if your mother's still here, or you've got a mother figure in your life that you want to acknowledge and honor, I want you to work up a 30-second video clip um, just honoring them uh, and showing your appreciation for all that they've sown into your life. Um, kids, I want to encourage you as well. I know you guys are out here making TikToks left and right, so go ahead and make a TikTok for Mommy just to let her know how much you love her, how much you care, and how much she's appreciated. You can submit those, and the deadline is tomorrow, so if you haven't done it, please go ahead and do that as soon as you can. Uh, again, the deadline for submissions is on Monday, um, and then we'll turn around on next Sunday. We'll put together an awesome Mother's Day tribute to all our mothers and the mother figures in our lives. I also want to call your attention to something else that's coming up on next week. Um, on next week, June the 7th, no, it's May. I'm running ahead of myself. May the 7th, we'll, from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock, we'll be hosting a National Day of Prayer. Now, we'll be doing that virtually. So I want to encourage you all. There'll be more information that will be coming out, but I want to encourage you all to mark that spot on your calendar to join us for a moment of prayer where we can pray and give God all the petitions of our heart. Um, let's be real, this COVID-19 situation has got us all acting a little out of sorts. Um, but I'm so thankful that we have a source uh, that we can go to with all of our concerns, all of our cares, and anything that may boggle our mind. Uh, please, again, join us on next Thursday, on this coming Thursday, actually, from 11 o'clock to 1 for our virtual uh, prayer vigil, National Day of Prayer. Uh, that's all that I have for you right now, but I plea, I want you to stay encouraged, uh, stay connected with us throughout the course of the week. Uh, while you're here online with us, rocking with us, please check the chat box. Man, there's a lot of lively conversations going on in there. Shout your hallelujahs. If you haven't already done that, please go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube page. It's FNBC Concord. You can find us there. Go ahead and subscribe to the page. Um, you have the vault of all of our old videos, some of our uh, Sam Productions, uh, Pastor's Messages, all kinds of goodies on that, um, on our um, Facebook channel. So please, hang out with us, enjoy this worship experience, and let's get ready to praise and worship our God. We've already embarked upon this new series, and this new series has been awesome. It's called Worth Finding. The first week we learned about a life that's worth finding. And last week, Pastor taught us about a contentment worth finding. This week, I know you're going to be just going to enjoy the message because it's about a love that's worth finding. And what greater love is there than the love that God expressed to us through his son and our savior, Jesus the Christ. So come on, enter into worship wherever you are. Let's celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this day. God bless you, and I'll be back in a little while. he will provide. I know he will give us what we need if we just wait. In due time, the Lord will deliver. He knows that we need him. And this is what we say to the Lord. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. you 
up at your throne. We need you, Lord. We need you right now. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, right now. Oh. lift our hands, we bow our knees, and we worship at your throne. Thank you, Lord, oh, right now. We need you, Lord. For joining us for virtual worship with First Missionary Baptist Church. Your FMBC family remains committed to being personally connected and radically changing. Now, if this is your first time joining us for virtual worship with FMBC, we want to make sure we connect with you. Please fill out a first-time guest connection card after worship. The virtual connection card may be found on our website at www dot fmbc dash concord dot org forward slash get started forward slash i knew for all of our first time guests who submit a virtual connection card we'll be sure to email you a gift card just our way of saying thank you for worshiping with us virtually Please know that while we remain under orders to stay at home, our church offices are still operating virtually. If you need to connect with us, you may do so by phone at 704 
786-6017. You may email us at info at fmbc-concord.org. Or you may send us postal mail to P.O. Box 1322, Concord, North Carolina 28026. And don't forget, you may also connect with us via our mobile app. If you haven't already, please download the FNBC mobile app today and stay connected with us. Speaking of staying connected, few things help us connect to God like prayer. On Thursday, May 7th, FNBC will be observing the National Day of Prayer with a special Facebook Live event. Join us on Facebook from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. for live corporate prayer. Then, if you have a personal prayer request, we'll have ministers and leaders on hand to pray with you live online. So please join us May 7th from 11 to 1. As our virtual host, Minister Womble, mentioned earlier, Mother's Day is just next Sunday, May 10th. We invite you to our virtual Mother's Day worship, where we will be airing a special Mother's Day tribute that you have an awesome opportunity to be involved in. Just send us your photo or 30-second video tribute by Monday, May 4th, to social media at FMBC. Dash concord.org. We'll also be giving away two $100 Visa E gift cards. You can spend them anywhere you want, any way you want. To register for one of these gift cards, simply fill out the online entry form on our website or from our mobile app. If you complete the form and send in a Mother's Day tribute, your name will be entered a second time and you'll get two chances to win $100. Now, how are we able to do all the things that we do here at FNBC? It's because all of you watching continue to partner with us in mission and ministry. You may partner with us by going out to our website and clicking the give link in the top right hand corner of the page. You may also partner with us by mailing in your gift to P.O. Box 1322 Concord, North Carolina 28026. And now you can also give by tapping our mobile app. Now, in just a moment, we're going to see a video that tells you how we do mission and ministry here at First Missionary. It'll give you a moment to go to our website and give, prepare your gift for mailing, or to tap the app. We pray that you enjoy the remainder of the worship experience. Good morning. This is Minister David Roundtree with the morning's prayer. 
Before we do that, I want to remind those of us who would like to submit a prayer request, you can do so confidentially by simply tapping the app. And on the front page of the app, if you scroll all the way down, you'll see where you can submit your confidential prayer request that way. For those of you who have a praise report or would like to chat with us during live stream, you can do so at that time by simply visiting the website fmbc-concord.org. I also would like um, to let us know about those families who have suffered loss at this time. Uh, the family of Tyra Waltower, Miss Doris Franklin, Gerald Cunningham, Tanya Salary, Donna Ponton, and also my family. Many of us have lost loved ones due to the COVID-19 virus. Let's keep these families in prayer. We also want to pray for our sick and shut-in. Those names are Mamie Addison, Annie Mae Shin, Emma Stark, Veda Perry, Claudette Bost, Lynn and Dorothy Arrington, Bertha Franklin, William and Iris Polk, Milton and Marie Talbert, Maria Wood, Leon Smith, Hafiza Smith, and also Wilbur Richardson. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father and our God, we're grateful that you've allowed us to assemble virtually to worship you again in spirit and in truth. We're grateful, Father God, that you have this furious longing for us to be in relationship with us. So much so that we have to ask, as the psalmist did, that what in the world is man that you're mindful of us? We're grateful, Father God, that you continue to come after us and to demonstrate your love toward us. We're grateful for that. And we give your name praise and glory. We lift up all, Father God, who are discouraged at this day and this time. We pray, God, that you will be the lifter up of their heads. And we thank you, Father God, for the hope, for the faith, for the love that you continue to pour out on us. We ask God in Jesus' name that you will continue to bless our worship, bless our pastor as he brings forth the word of God. Bless him, Father God, to speak the word with clarity. And bless us, Father God, to receive the word in our hearts that we may apply it. We do love you, God, and we thank you for doing all things well. We thank you, Father God, for not only lifting our heads, not only giving us hope and faith, but we thank you, Father God, just for your presence. For that alone, God, is enough. But we give your name all praise and all glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
You thought I was to die for Cause you sacrificed your life So I can be free So I can be whole So I can tell everyone I know You thought I was worth So you came Came and clean me up inside. You thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed your life so I can be free, so I can be whole, so I can tell everyone I know. You can. You thought I was to die for You sacrificed for life So I can be free So I can be whole So I can tell everyone I know So you can Up inside, you thought I was to die for, but you sacrificed your life so I can be free, so I can be whole, so I can tell everyone I know. give you honor. I worship you, Lord, forever. Because I am, because I am, and I can tell everyone I know. And I will praise you. I give you glory. I give you honor forever, forever and ever and ever. Oh, forever, forever. Because, because I am with my God. Even when I was saved. came and changed my life you thought I was worth keeping you cleaned me up inside you thought I was to die for mm-hmm. you thought I was to die for oh, oh, oh. you thought I was to Die for oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. you thought I was to die for oh, oh, oh. because I am free. Good morning, everyone. 
It is so good to see you, and, and we thank our praise and worship team for that timely selection as we continue our series, Worth Finding. And today we're going to talk about a love worth finding. But before I do, I want to just get us a quick review on what we have traveled for through thus far. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about uh, our having a life worth finding, and after we found our lives, then we learned on last week we need to have contentment worth finding. And we understand that contentment means having a peace uh, despite having internal peace, despite your internal struggles. And I gave you four gems on last week. And the first one was to establish a standard, a reasonable standard of living. Uh, the second one was to have an attitude of gratitude. And the third one is to have, uh, for us to reject a fearful spirit. And then the fourth one, we want to seek God's will and trust his promises. And our bottom line was, is that the root of your life is the fruit of your life. And so uh, as, as we continue our, our series today, uh, I want to talk today about a love worth finding. Now, the, the truth be told, uh, everyone, I don't know of a single person on the face of the earth that does not want to experience love. The problem is, what is really true love? How do we know that we have a love worth finding? Uh, there are many different kinds of love. There's that erotic love. There's that uh, brotherly love. And then there's that family love. But what about that love that is selfless, that puts itself on the line for your benefit, regardless of who you are and how you are? Uh, that's the lesson we're going to learn today. And if you would open your Bibles, and for those of you while you open your Bibles, I do want to give you a couple of reminders. If you have not pulled down our new app, I want to encourage you right now to go out to your app store uh, and pull down our new app. As you look for our FMBC logo, or you can text us uh, the word Concord FMBC and then put a space and then the word app to 77977 and that ought to be coming up in your chat box if you're watching us on YouTube. Now why is this app so important? Because everywhere you go, we go with you. You learned earlier, if this is your first time being online with us, we got a great gift for you. So if you just tap the app and hit out and go down and uh, connect with us, we got an e-gift that we'll send out to you. We also found out how quick and easy it is to give on our app. If you want to support this ministry as we continue to uh, help people locally and globally, uh, you can do that as well. And then you learn if you've got prayer requests, uh, you can just scroll right down to the bottom of the app and you can put in your prayer request and someone from our prayer team uh, will contact you personally uh, to pray with you uh, regardless of where you are. We'll will make that call. But now what I'm excited about it for is how you can use it while I'm preaching and teaching. Uh, you can do your sermon notes as I give you your, your gems, as I drop those gems on you. If you just go down there to worship and you hit the... Uh, the worship tab down at the bottom, you can then go to sermon notes and you can follow that along. And when I give you your Bible reference, uh, you can just hit the Bible right there and you have it all right here in your hand just by tapping the app. So for those of you who have your app, just tap the word Bible there and I want you to go to Romans, uh, the sixth chapter. And while you're finding that, I want to remind you, you can still sign up for growth groups. We had a great time on last week, and there's still room if you want to. Just You can find that right on the app as well. Uh, we want you to do that. And then we want you to stick around at the worship for Holy Communion for those of you who believe that Jesus lived, that he died, that he rose from the dead. And then on this coming Thursday, you'll see more of this on Facebook and on our social media about National Prayer Day, and we're going to spend from 11 to 1, uh, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Thursday, having an awesome time of prayer. So now, open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Romans, and I want you to go to the fifth chapter, 
And I want us to look at verses 6 through 8. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 6 through 8. And I'll come from the NIV version of, of the Bible. And as you see in the Bible app, you've got many different versions, but I want to focus on the NIV for today. Uh, hear the word of the Lord. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone, listen to this now, will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Here's verse number eight now. Listen to this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, this is an awesome passage of, of scripture. Uh, it, 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 this is so powerful. I, I want you to just sit down and, and listen to a love worth finding. Now, Paul wrote this letter uh, to a church he had yet to come to. Uh, there are many reasons he wrote this letter, but in chapter 5 here now, it's coming off of the heels of really starting at chapter 1 all the way in, where Paul first talks about the depression depravity of humanity. Uh, and I want to encourage you to read the whole book of Romans. I believe it's about 16 chapters, but you could do it in about 45 minutes or so. Uh, but chapter one talks about how bad off we are. And then in chapter three, he talks about uh, how all of us have sinned and fallen short. In fact, he said, no, the wages of sin is death, uh, but the gift of God is eternal life. And then he talks about uh, this relationship with Abraham, and then he also now is talking about what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. And what I want to share with you here is that God loves us so much, and, and I want to show you how great this love is and how much much it is worth finding. Look what he says here. He says just, he says at just the right time. Look at verse number six now. At just the right time. What does this say? This word just at the right time is talking about when God came to deliver us. He wasn't late and nor was he early. Uh, this word means that God uh, had a divine appointment in history, a historical moment when he stuck his finger in the sand and says, this is when I'm going to come and save humanity. He, now, when you read the Bible, let me slow down because I get excited here. When you read the Bible, there were times when sin was so rampant, but it wasn't quite yet time for God to come and do a total saving of humanity. And so God had some stop gap, gap measures along the way. Uh, let me give you the first one. Many of you have heard about the worldwide flood that happened during the days of Noah, where during the days of Noah, Sin had gotten so bad that God's heart was broken that he had even made us. And so he wiped out of all humanity and started all back over again. But it wasn't quite time yet for him to do what he was going to do through Christ Jesus because the world wasn't fully populated yet. And God wanted to have more people to love and more people to love him. And so shortly thereafter, if you go, that's in chapter 6 of Genesis through chapter 9. But then when you get over to chapter 11 of Genesis, you see that humanity again had messed up. And so God had to do something miraculous again. He had to confuse our tongues. Many of us wonder why there's so many different languages on the face of the earth. And it was so that we wouldn't come together to do bad things things together. Uh, you know when we all can speak the same language and get on one accord until we have the mind of God we will do wicked things. 
And so God had to confuse our tongue. Why? Because it wasn't just the right time yet. And then God had to do something again when he took the children of Israel into Egypt. And when he brought them out, he had to destroy the Egyptian army. Uh, but he didn't destroy the whole world. Why? Because it wasn't quite time yet. And you can go on and on as you read the Bible that there were many times when God had to put... Uh, what can I say, salvation on pause or to divert sin just long enough until God could get to this point in history when it was just the right time. Now, what made this time so right that God didn't come earlier and God didn't come later? Well, I'm glad you asked. During the time that when Jesus was born, it was the time that civilization had reached a point where there was common roads to get to almost any place in the world. There was a common commerce. Uh, there were roads. There was communication. And all the things for the rest of what we have done have, were ready to be built out. And so God brought Jesus in at that very appointed time when he saw that this was the appropriate time for humanity to be saved because now there would be a language that could take the gospel to the end of the world. Notice now, he says, just at the right time when we were, watch this, still powerless. Now, that word powerless means just what it says. When we didn't have any strength, when we didn't have the ability, when we didn't have the wherewithal. But what was it that we were powerless to do or what was it that we didn't have the wherewithal uh, to do or what was it that we were incapable of doing? There were several things, but the main thing that we were powerless to do was it, we were powerless to get into a right relationship with God. We didn't have any ability of our own. There was nothing we could say. There was nothing we could do. There was nothing we could take God. We had nothing to offer God. We were powerless. So let me just put a pause right here. For some of you, you may uh, have what I call a work righteous uh, relationship that you think there's something you can do to win God's favor. There is nothing that we can do to win God's favor other than what God wants us to do, and that is to accept his finished work in Jesus Christ. So regardless of what other faith in the world you may practice or feel is a right way to get to God, none other, no other way no one else can come to God except through Christ Jesus. So all of humanity was powerless. Notice the text says, at just the right time when we were still powerless, when we were totally unable to come to God, when we had nothing to do, look what God did for us. He says, Christ died. This is, this is the point in history uh, when God did something for us when we couldn't do something for ourselves. Now notice who he died for. Not only were we powerless, he says, but God died for the ungodly. Now, ungodly, what does that mean? That means not like God. That means that we weren't even caring for God. In fact, the word means that we were disrespecting God. It didn't say he died for the atheists because atheists don't even think there is a God, but guess what? That makes them ungodly also. It didn't say he, he died for us because we were guilty, but although we are, but we were doing ungodly things. Now, this, this, so, so let me just drop this first gem on you here uh, that, that you need to. And I've said this one before, and, but it's still appropriate. Uh, Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves. If we were powerless, if we didn't have the strength, if we had nothing to use to negotiate with God, uh, then God had to do something for us if we were ever going to get back into a right relationship with him. Not only were we powerless, but we weren't even thinking about him if we were doing ungodly things. Watch this now. 
He does, the, Paul does an awesome job in showing the, uh, the magnitude and, uh, of Christ dying for the ungodly. Look what he says next. He says, now, Christ died, look now, when we were powerless and ungodly. That's a terrible state to be in. And, and God, God did something for us when we weren't doing anything for him or even thinking about him. Notice what he does. Now watch this parallel, uh, or this contrast that he draws here when he says that Christ died for us, for the ungodly. But notice now he says very rarely, very rarely would anyone, notice now, this is verse number seven, I believe. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Now let's stop right there because you say a righteous person. You, you feel that that's somebody worthy of dying for. But in, in what Paul is saying here, he, he's talking about this is just someone who has integrity but doesn't necessarily mean they're kind or benevolent. Doesn't mean they do anything for anybody. It's just that they may obey some laws. You know people like that. They are righteous people. Uh, they do the right things but they don't help anybody they don't give anything to anybody and so he's saying now very rarely in fact let me just ask you if you know of someone like that would you be willing to give your life for them I think the text is clear it says very rarely and so next he draws the next uh, comparison he says he says though for a good person all right, someone might possibly dare to die. Now, 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 let's look at that word good. That word good means useful and kind and considerate and compassionate, meaning that there's something that they have done for you that could possibly draw you close enough to even consider dying. Uh, there was this uh, true story uh, This happened often uh, and many of our Vietnam vets uh, can identify with this uh, that when we were stationed in Vietnam that there were these camps where the children some of them had become uh, uh, parentless because of the war and so when these kids would be outside of the American camp a lot of the American soldiers would befriend the children and they would become very friendly with the children and even somewhat parental in helping them and these close relationships were very dangerous because oftentimes the Viet Cong would take one of these children that they knew that the Americans had become very affectionate with and they had become very fond of the Americans and they would strap bombs on these little kids calling kamikazes and have them go into the camps to blow up those they love. And the story was once told where this one little girl had become very fond of this man who had treated her like a daughter. That as she was coming into the camp that day and she, she locked eye with him and he with her that she paused long enough and opened up her blouse and so that she, he could see that she was strapped with a bomb. And he knew that if she came any closer that it would kill him and all the other the soldiers she loved him well enough that he she allowed him to kill her before she would kill him that's a good person that was worth dying for but they say possibly might this young girl had that kind of compassion but most of us don't most of us don't and so let me drop this gem on you about the type of love that we have. Our love is limited and has limitations. Let's just be real about it. There's very, very few. There's a short list you have. Let's be real. Of folks that you would really, 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 really die for. In fact, let's just be plain. If someone needed a heart transplant and they needed yours and it was your child, would the question be, well, is there any other way? Or what about a kidney or a liver or, or all those other organs? If 
if it was a loved one, a very good friend of yours. Limitations, limited, limited. We say we love you well enough to die, but if we were really pushed, would we? I hope you never have to make that choice. But here's where I want to hang out for the next hour or two. I mean, you're staying at home, right? You're watching, you're watching newsreels for hours on hours on hours. So let me help you out here. Let, settle down with me right here. Notice what verse number eight says. I always love the word. When you see this word in, in, in scripture and you've heard me when I teach classes and things of that nature, but anytime you see the word but in the Bible, it means that we're now going in a different direction. We just talked about our love is limited and has limitations. But notice what the text says in verse number eight. It says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. So let's just talk about God's demonstration. This word God demonstrate, the first thing I want you to notice is, is that it's in the present tense, which means God continues to do this. God has, it didn't say God demonstrated. It says God demonstrates. This means that God is always, has always, and will always continue to demonstrate his love. Notice now that word demonstrate means to show your character, to show your nature, to, sh to, to display an action that tells something, something about you. Uh, it says here that he demonstrated. Now what it tells us, it doesn't tell us in that word what it demonstrates, but he tells us here that God demonstrated his own love. Watch this now. He demonstrated his own love. So, so this, this tells us the magnitude of what God is about to do. Now, the story was told when we talk about how we demonstrate something. How do we demonstrate our love for one another? It really means it demonstrates how much something matters to you. Now, the story was told about these four men who loved to play golf. I mean, golf was their favorite game, and they loved each other very much. And Saturday was their golfing day, and they would love to get together and hang out and play golf with each other on every Saturday. And they loved each other, and they loved golf, but they made a pact with each other. And they gave these strict instructions to their spouses. They each told their spouse that if in the event that either one of their golfing buddies were to die, that they were not to have the funeral on Saturday. Now notice I said that they loved each other and they really loved golf. They were going to demonstrate, they were going to have to demonstrate their love for either their friend or for golf. And so what they did was to not put their friend in a predicament to have to choose which one they loved more. They instructed their spouses to not hold their funerals on Saturday in fear that their friends may not be there. But that's not how God operates. Notice what it says. It says, God demonstrated his love for us in this. What is the in this? Look what it says next. While we were still sinners. Now we've talked about this word sinners because many of us don't like to think we're sinners, especially if we do good things. But I want to sit down here for a few minutes and help us to understand because about three or four weeks ago, I told you that sin is the stuff we do bad that makes God sad. Sin is the stuff we do bad that makes God sad. Uh, biblically speaking, we would say it is the transgressions of the law. Now, what law are we talking about? Well, most of us would refer to the Ten Commandments, which is a very good place to go. But if you read through the Bible, 
There are hundreds of different sins that you can commit uh, that will cause you to be considered uh, doing something bad. Uh, but all of those other hundreds of sin would fall up under the Ten Commandments. Uh, you know the first one, you should have no other God before me. That means anything that you place above God, whether it's your work, whether it's your family, they could be what you think are good things. That is something that you have placed before God. You can just keep listing and all of those sins would fall up under there. Uh, the next one says you're to make no image of God. Now, why not an image of God? Well, because we're created in his image, and we're the ones who's supposed to represent him. So if there's anything that you worship, like your car or your house, that you would be willing to kill someone over or to die for, that is an image you have made in of God. And the third one says uh, that you are to uh, let's see, you, not, no uh, image. Oh, not to use the Lord's name in vain. Now, this one is one that is a, so abused. Uh, it, it, it is, to me, it becomes like chalk on a board. I don't know if somebody might be like nails. <sighs> That's just, just screeching. But we just use it even as believers. We just throw the Lord's name out there so easily. And it's a name of reverence. We're not to use it in vain. And then the fourth one, it says, keep the Sabbath day holy. That means to set aside some time to be with the Lord, to worship him, and to worship with others. And we're to do that. And then the next one is honor thy father and thy mother. And next week we're going to be doing that. And don't forget to sign up because uh, we're going to be giving away some great prizes. But we're to honor our father and mothers. Do you know that there is in the Bible where is, if a child cursed their parent that you could kill them? I think we need to bring that one back. There's so much disrespect for parents. Then how about this one? You should not murder. Well, many of us may have not commit physical murder, but Jesus says we can murder with our mouths. We kill people with our words. Hmm. It says we should not commit adultery. Most of us just think that's when a married person has uh, sex with another person. But there's a whole list of sensual sins that come up under that. Thou should not steal. Most of us wouldn't think that we steal. We don't go into stores and take things that don't belong to us. But what if you're slack on your job? What if you uh, increase your benefits on your tax refund so that you can get more? There are many ways that we steal and break the law. How about this one? We shouldn't bear false witness. That's a lying tongue and all the other things we do. What about this covetedness? Many of us covet things that other people have. So what does sin really mean? Well, I think I, I got a demonstration here that I think would really, really help you because what sin means is when we try uh, to get ourselves together and, and think that we are good and that we can do things uh, that, that please God, uh, sin actually means uh, that it, it, it's like throwing darts. Any of you ever played darts? It's, it's like, you see that bullseye there? It's like us trying to, to meet, meet God and get to God and try to do things that are pleasing to God and I don't care how well we aim uh, some of it we get close and then some of we're not even close some of us are way out of the picture oops so sin means we missed the mark I don't care how good you are how great you are we missed the mark there are many passages of scripture uh, that I can give you. I'm just going to give you a few that you can go back and look at later. I think it's 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 19 through 21, I believe. I believe it's also in uh, Romans, the first chapter. Uh, read all of that and you'll find a list. Uh, there's a list in Galatians. I believe it's Galatians 5, 19 through 21. 
uh, and then Revelation 21, 8, I believe. You can find a bunch of them. But notice what the text says. God demonstrated his love for us in this while we were still. While we were doing all the things we wanted to do. Notice what it said. Christ died for us. Put your name right there. Where it says for us, Christ died for Herb Redrick. That ought to be a humbling thing. It, God didn't wait for me to get right to come to him. I came to God and he got me right. He has that same offer for you. You see, if our greatest need had been for us to have machinery and equipment, God would have sent us a mechanical engineer. If our greatest need had been for medicine, God would have sent us a chemist. If our greatest need had been for music, God would have sent us a musician. If our greatest need had been for education, God would have sent us a teacher. If our greatest need had been for entertainment, God would have sent us an entertainer. If our greatest need had been for food, God would have sent us a farmer. If our greatest need had been for fashion, God would have sent us a fashion designer. If our greatest need had been for technology, God would have sent us an engineer. But our greatest need was for salvation. So God sent us his only begotten son who came down 42 long generations, walked the dusty roads of Jerusalem, turned water into wine, walked out on the sea and said, peace, be still. He took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed a multitude. God saw our greatest need. That was our greatest need. Oh, yes, Jesus did miracles and Jesus did many things and, and many religions recognize him as that. But that's not what they need. We just don't need a teacher. We just don't need a miracle worker. No, we need salvation. And that's what Christ has done for us. And that's how God demonstrated his love for us, his own love. How in his only begotten son. No, not like some might think that he was just one of his sons. No, he was the only one that had the same nature, same heart, same mind, the same everything of God. Why? Because he's God in the flesh. And God says no one can come to him except through his son, Christ Jesus. For God so loved the world. That includes you. And you, wherever you may be, all across the world, whether you listen to us locally or globally, God loves you. It doesn't matter how bad you are. Notice he says, while you are still sinners, that ought to be good news. You don't have to worry about trying to get right with God and come to God. No, you come to God and God will get you right. Oh, I'm so grateful because I once was sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore, barely deeply stained within, looking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters, lifted me. Now safe, safe, safe am I. That's a love worth finding. Forget about all those other kinds of things that has drawn you and captures your mind and your affection. There's no one who loves you like God loves you. Not your mother, not your father, not your brother, not your sister, not your job, not your wife. No one. That's why he says have no other God before him. And if God loves you that much, guess what? He's going to take care of you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to show you how to get through COVID-19. But he wants to have a relationship with you more so than a few minutes on Sunday morning. If it's a love worth finding, it's a love worth investing in. 
So let me give you your last. Well, let's see. Did I skip one? Did I give you? Oh, no. Let me give you your last gem before I give you some points to remember. God's love for us is not based on our getting, getting ourselves together. I've been saying that. It's not based on our getting our act together. That's not what it's based on. It's based on his love for us. That's the kind of God we serve. So let me just tell you about some four gems of why this is a love worth finding. First, it's a love that is priceless. We couldn't pay God. So all of those faiths that have some kind of work righteousness that you can get into a right relationship with God, there's nothing we can give him. It is priceless. The second thing is that it is unconditional. And you can find that in Romans 5, 6. It is, I mean, 5, 7. It is unconditional. It's not limited. It's not based on our being good. It's not based on our being who we are or what family we're a part of. It's not based on any of that. God sets no conditions on his loving us. Notice, we were powerless, we were ungodly, and we were sinners. That's how much he loved us. If he loved us when we were like that, how much more do you think he loves us when we surrender to him? Thirdly, his love is not based on words, it's based on action. Many of us have been duped by what people say. Notice the text in Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated or demonstrates. He's done it over and over and over again. And last but not least, a love worth finding is personal. You see that it says he demonstrated his own love for us. It was his love. For us, it was personal. He didn't send an angel. He didn't send an animal. He didn't send some abstract uh, animated object like a tree or a bird or in anything of that nature, a fish or water. No, 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 no. He sent his son. It was personal. And that's a love worth finding. Let me have a word of prayer for you. And... Minister Fred would be coming up to give you some closing comments. Bow your heads with me. Gracious and merciful Father, I thank you for sending your son Jesus who died for us while we were powerless, ungodly sinners. While we weren't even thinking about you at just the right time in history, you brought forth your son, born of a woman, to die on a cross so that we could have the right to the tree of life. And so, Father, for that reason, we say thank you. Now, Father, we ask that you forgive us when we haven't lived a life worthy of it, when we keep missing the mark, when we keep falling short, when we do those things that are so bad that they make you sad. So Father, I ask right now that you forgive us so that we can have a love worth finding. In Jesus' name I do pray and all of God's people said, amen. Stand by for Minister Fred.
a powerful message this morning. Um, I pray that something was said and or done to help you feel this great love that our God has for each of us. I don't know about you, but that resonated with me because just like the hymn writer said, I was that person that was sinking <laughs> deep in my sin and I was far from any kind of peaceful shore. But I'm so glad that our God being the master of the sea heard my cries and from the waters he lifted me. Now all of us are safe. It was love that lifted us. And that's what we learned about this great love, this agape love. Our pastor took us on a journey about, he hit us with the, the, three, the three different other types of love, that brotherly love, that affection that we have one for another, brothers and sisters, and the love that we have for our children. Even the love that we have for our significant others, that eros love, but it all pales in comparison to an agape love, an unconditional love, that only kind of love that can come from the sovereign God of the universe. It reminds me of that parable that Jesus taught, the parable of the prodigal son. You remember that? Luke, the 15th chapter. A lot of times we, we remember and we hear that story and we focus on the younger son who took his his inheritance and ran off to do things his way. But the story is really about the father. The father who loved his son regardless of what he had done. Regardless of who he'd become. But he loved him for who he was. His son. Flesh of his flesh and blood of his blood. His beloved son. That's what that parable is about. And that's what this message was about. God's unfailing love for all mankind. Jesus Christ did something for us we couldn't do for ourselves. And for that, I'm so thankful. I want to leave you with the bottom line for today's message. And the bottom line is this. To appreciate God's great love for us, we must first understand our greatest need for him. This COVID-19 world has shown us what's really important. Um, we're chasing all kinds of wrong things, but the only thing that matters it's the love of our son, that, the love of our God that was expressed to us through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of his son and our savior, Jesus the Christ. So I want to extend an invitation to anyone who's watching us, wherever you may be. Know that you're not right. We're, none of us are right. None of us are worthy of Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. But because of God's great love for all of humankind, he saw fit to give us a savior. He saw our faults, but he expressed his love for us in our needs, knowing that we needed that Savior. That's Jesus. I want to extend that invitation to you today, wherever you are, to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what you're doing now, regardless of what you've been planning to do. Know that God's grace and his love covers a multitude of sin. If that's you, please know that he wants nothing more than a relationship with you. Just like the father in the parable, he's going to look out for you wherever you may be. He's always watching, waiting, crying out, searching, seeking you. Pastor told us, put your name in that verse. While I was yet a sinner, while Fred was yet a sinner, <laughs> God loved me enough to send me a savior. Don't wait to get right. Do it now. Do it now while you have blood still running warm in your veins. Do it now while you still have the air just filling up your lungs. Accept that free gift of pardoning of your sins by accepting Jesus Christ. And you know what? This is what I love about it. Our faith is totally different than other faiths. Check it out. It's so simple. I tell kids, I teach kids this all the time. It's as easy as ABC. Hey, admit that you're a sinner. Admit that you've done things bad that makes God's heart sad. And even if you don't do those things that make God sad, you know one thing that you haven't done that would make him glad? You haven't accepted his son, Jesus Christ, into your life as Lord and Savior. Just admit that freely, openly, honestly. And then B, believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. The son of the one true and living God who was born of a virgin, who walked the dusty roads of Jerusalem, who 
who died a sinner's death on a cross to pay the penalty of sin for all of mankind. And then C, commit to live your life all day, every day, according to his word, according to his will, and according to his way. And if that's you, if, if you've done your ABCs, congratulations. You've now been accepted into the family of the God of the universe, whose love is never ending, whose power has no equal, whose presence is unmatched. Congratulations, you're a part of his family. There's no greater place that you could be. I just, again, I thank you for being with us here today. And again, I pray that something was said or done to help you feel God's presence and power in our praise and in our worship because our God truly deserves it all. I do want to remind you that submission for Mother's Day tribute videos is tomorrow. So please lavish and shower our mothers and mother figures with love. Shoot us a 30 second video. You can send it to social media at fnbc-concord.org. We're going to put them all together for a wonderful tribute to our mothers on next Sunday for Mother's Day. But also, on this coming Thursday, from 11 a.m. to 1 a.m., please join us for a virtual prayer vigil as we celebrate the National Day of Prayer. Uh, as you look around and you watch the news, you see that this world is in need of prayer. And it's now time for God's people to stand up, to toe the line, and to intercede on the world's behalf. We also want to encourage you, also going back to Mother's Day, please, with that video, guess what? You're eligible for you've, a, an additional drawing from the prize, uh, into the prize bank. So mothers, go ahead and register online. See us at uh, fnbc-concord.org. You can register there. That's your first entry. But then if your family submits a video, that's your second entry. So you get a double chance of winning uh, an awesome prize. We thank you guys, but we also want you to stay connected with us as well. Stay connected with us via social media. You can follow our pastor on Twitter at Herb Redrick. You can also follow what's going on at FNBC on our Instagram page as well as on our Facebook page. Again, I just thank you all for hanging out with us. Uh, please continue to stay connected with us virtually but also in prayer as we'll be praying for you all. I thank you for being with us and I want to have a closing word of prayer with you in the benediction. Let us bow. All wise and most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your unfailing love, how great your love is, Father God, that it washes us each and every day. Forgive us, Father God, when we've taken it for granted, Lord, and we run past those blessings that you bestow upon us. But right here, right now, we want to acknowledge you, Father God, and for your great and unfailing and all-encompassing love for all of mankind. We pray that something was said or done today, Father God, to help some man, some woman, some boy, some girl know that you love them. And that your love is without condition and your love is without end. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne. To God alone who is wise be all glory and majesty, all dominion and power, now and forevermore. And all of God's people agreed and said, amen. Now I want to encourage you to hang out with us for a couple minutes for our communion service for our believer ceremony. So take a few minutes, get your crackers and get your juice ready as we celebrate a meal that's fit for the king. God bless you and we love you. See you in a bit.
you all for being here as we prepare now for Holy Communion. Uh, what a fitting message to take us right into Holy Communion, a love worth finding. Uh, God did something for us, as I said earlier, that we could not do for ourselves. And when I think about it, and if you would just think about the night that Jesus was preparing to die, he was having a holy meal with frenemies. Now, if you don't know what a frenemy is, I'll encourage you to look it up. It is someone who's trying to be your friend, but also is your enemy. God was our friend totally, but we were frenemies to Christ Jesus. That means we want the benefits of the friendship while we still do what we want against him or not for him. He tells us not to approach his tables as frenemies. But this table is to remind us what he has done for us through the giving of his life, his death, burial, and resurrection. There are many things that you may remember in the Bible but I want you to search it through and I want you to find all the things that Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. He didn't tell us to remember Christmas and that has gotten so blown out of proportion. Uh, he did get baptized. He didn't tell us to get baptized, but he did get baptized. But this is the only, only sacrament when you read through all the scriptures, that he says, do this in remembrance of me. And so it's not something that should be entered into lightly. And so I encourage you that before we take of these elements, that we're going to pause for a moment of confession. And that we're just going to confess to God that since the last time we had communion, up until this time we're having communion, there are many things we know that we did not do that made you sad. That we have sinned against heaven and against earth. We've sinned against our fellow men and women and brothers and sisters. And so I want to encourage you right now to just pause. And even if you have your children there to help them understand that you as an adult and they as children have done things that haven't been pleasing to God. But the text also tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not die nor perish. And it's through this element here, it's through this act of remembrance that we're making that confession to the world and even to God and to ourselves that we believe that Jesus is the Christ. So let us bow for a word of prayer. Gracious and merciful Father, we thank you for this day. For this is the day that you have made and we're learning to rejoice and be glad in it. And Father, we're thanking you for the gift that you have given us in Christ Jesus. While we were frenemies, while we weren't even thinking about you, while we were powerless, while we were ungodly, while we were sinners, you did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. But Father, for those of us who have confessed that Jesus is the Christ, now, Father, we want to have this holy meal with you. So we ask that you will remove all of our sins as far as the east is from the west and remember them no more. Then, Father, we ask that you create in us a clean heart, renew in us a right spirit, that we may become and be the kind of people you called us to be in these last and evil days. Father, I thank you for this time that we can sup with you and as we're supping with others globally in our homes and wherever we find ourselves. We ask your blessings upon the elements that we each are holding and have, your blessings upon the bread, your blessings upon the juice that represents your shed blood. Father, we ask that you would consecrate it now, make it holy, make it set apart for you and for us. In Jesus' name I do pray, and all of God's children said,
Amen. If you would now take your unleavened bread, hopefully. Uh, remember on last month uh, that uh, Ichabod Judas taught us that the bread needed to be unleavened because leaven represents sin. And we want to represent, this bread represents Christ's body, which had no sin. So let us now take this bread, which represents Christ's body, which had no sin, and let us now eat together. And in the same manner, let us take this cup, which represents his shed blood, which we know that without the shedding of innocent blood, meaning sinless, done no wrong, there could be no remission of sin. And that is why Jesus' blood is the only blood that can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so in our drinking this, we're saying that he already lives inside of us. And we're drinking this that represents what he's done for us on Calvary's cross. Let us drink together. And in so doing, we do show the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection until, until he comes again. God bless you. We thank you for spending Holy Communion with us. We pray that you'll join us this week uh, with the activities that we have planned as we continue to draw closer to God. Uh, join your growth group so that you can draw closer to him as we've done here today. And then prepare to be with us on Thursday afternoon for Holy Communion. I do want to, ch I mean, uh, prayer vision. I do want to challenge you to think of five people who you know are far from God and be praying for them, especially on Thursday, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. I'll give you more details on that. Keep your eye out on social media for the upcoming details. God bless you, and we'll see you this week. Hear the good news, you've been invited, no matter what others may say, your darkest sins will be forgiven, and you will always have a at the table of grace, the cup's never empty, the plate's always full, and it's never too late to come and be filled with love never ending. You're always welcome at the table Don't try to hide your earthly scars For in His eyes we all are equals Don't be afraid, come as you are At the table of grace Cups never empty, the plate's always full, and it's never too late to come and be filled with love never ending. You're always welcome at the table of grace, at the table of grace. Cups never empty, the plate's always full, and it's never too late to come and be filled with love.
love never ending you're always welcome at the table of grace so let the first become the last let the poor put kings to shame their willing hearts will be their treasure by the power of jesus name at the table of grace the cups never end always full and it's never too late to come and be filled with love never ending you're always welcome at the table of grace at the table of grace the cups never empty the plate's always full, and it's never too late to come and be filled with love never ending. You're always welcome at the table of grace. Everybody's welcome at the table of grace.